Thank you very much. Um, yeah, first of all, I would like to um, thank the organizers for allowing me to de delay the lunch break for another about 40 minutes. Um, I will also talk about critical ON models um, above four dimensions, and um, in this case, I would like to add some of the ERG perspective to some of the things that were discussed by uh, Igor Klebanov in the previous talk. And here, um, I have the pleasure to rep represent um, the project that I've done earlier this year together with Astrid and, and Lukas. So, um, ah, um, as the outline of my talk, I will start with a short introduction that basically repeats some of the things that were already introduced. So I will um, discuss a little bit uh, the ON model um, below and above four dimensions and then um, show how uh, the work by Klebotnov and co-workers uh, put a little bit a different perspective to that. Um, but at the same time, at least for uh, somebody who is a practitioner of the ERG um, approach, um, this, this cubic model has brought up basically three questions that we would like to address within, within the, the FRG. Then, of course, I will not really thoroughly introduce the FRG approach on the last day of the conference once again, but just highlight some of the features that uh, I think are important and maybe advantages to, to find out some, uh, to find some answers to these questions. So, yeah, and then um, I will set up the, the calculations and compare and connect to these previous results. And after all, uh, in, in the end, or in, in the middle of my talk, of course I will have to um, offer some answers to the questions I have uh, raised. So. Um, as for the introduction, um, yeah, we have seen during the conference a, a number of very nice, sophisticated flow equations for all types of fields in all types of dimensions. And um, I think even, yeah, um, this is nothing compared to the equation that I will show you in the following slide, so please hold on to your seats. Um, here's the beta function for the quartic coupling um, of an ON symmetric model. Uh, in leading order of the epsilon expansion close to four dimensions, which is the upper critical dimension. And of course, everybody of you knows that. Um, the ON model uh, below four dimensions has an interacting fixed point um, for a positive value of the quartic coupling. And um, this fixed point is infrared attractive, basically meaning that we get in the infrared scaling solutions once we tune an additional relevant direction and we can basically explain scaling behavior or critical behavior of statistical models. When we now go um, to uh, dimensionality that is above four, or in other words, to an epsilon that is smaller than zero, just in this very same calculation, we still get a, um, um, UV, uh, we get a non-trivial fixed point anyway, but um, as this basically is just a sign change here in this, uh, in this equation, it means that we get the very same fixed point, uh, but this time with a negative quartic coupling, and um, it is not infrared attractive, but UV attractive. And um, at the same time, so due to this negative quartic coupling, an issue raises immediately, that is the issue of stability that also was uh, discussed in, in the previous talk a little bit. So you would say, from the first point of view, this is a little bit discouraging, so um, one might not give up immediately, but um, there was this very nice work by um, Klebanov and, and co-workers, and they put a little bit of a new perspective into that question by uh, basically um, Harvard Stratonovich transforming the, the quartic coupling in this theory and introducing a, a real scalar field Z, which is basically here can be represented by um, an exchange diagram like that. And um, just to repeat very quickly what they found here, so uh, when you do this, you have a cubic theory that has an upper critical dimension of, of six. And uh, what they find is once they go to a quite large number of field components at leading order in the epsilon expansion, that there's a real valued fixed point. And um, as we have seen, this is an example of a, of a UV, com can be interpreted as a, an example of a UV completion of the theory, um, or in other words, um, it's something like an asymptotically safe model in that case. So um, 
then you can, this, this is really interesting, so you can start wondering um, what is the critical n in, in higher orders of this loop expansion and you find that, for example, when you go to five dimensions, which is naturally a dimension of interest, you find um, 64, which is a really strong decrease as compared to the, um, to the first order result. And then you can go on to um, 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 next, uh, next order in the absolute expansion and apply resummation techniques and then it pops up again to, uh, to about 400. So there's no, um, well, I don't know what, what the real value there or what the conclusion should be from this uh, at the moment. So, and that uh, brings me uh, basically immediately to, the, um, to, the, to a number of questions with the first one being quite obvious. It's, uh, so what is the true number of the critical, um, uh, the true critical number of, of field components in, in five dimensions. And um, so I will um, here add some ERG or FRG perspective to that, to that question. Um, and it's motivated by the observation that there's obviously a strong dependence on the loop order in the perturbative RG approach. The second question is that, um, so when we introduced um, the model, the cubic model starting from the pure ON model, um, we were thinking of something that um, the, the uh, model with the hubbard sotonovich transformation is basically some sort of equivalent uh, model to, to the original ON model. So at least on a classical level. And now the question is whether this equivalence basically holds if we go on and um, run the RG flaw, or in other words, if we go to the quantum level of the theory. So we can ask basically, do these two theories really share the same set of critical exponents? And um, the third question, which I would like to ask, and which is maybe um, yeah, the most obvious one also, uh, that is, uh, what is about the stability of the potential in this, at the fixed point of this theory? So a cubic theory, after all, is not bounded from below. So somehow you should address this, this question if you want to make sense out of this theory in five dimensions or above four dimensions in general. So and uh, I have to offer um, our first ERG perspective on these questions. So um, the FRG approach, um, of course, we have all appreciated um, this uh, equation of Christoph. And um, so let me only highlight some of, the, um, some of the features that I think are interesting in this very context. So what we use this equation to calculate beta functions for model couplings and to calculate interacting RG fixed points. And uh, finally, also critical behavior and critical exponents. And um, one thing that I want to emphasize here Two is that um, this equation allows you to connect in a controlled way to other, to other approaches, of course. So, for example, we can easily connect to the, to the results from the um, leading order epsilon expansion and, and uh, to make sure that we are really talking about the same fixed point at that point. So that we are not just finding any fix, uh, an arbitrary fixed point in theory space and then we analyze it and finally we find out that this is a whole different story. Now, we can really, in a controlled way, connect to this fixed point. And, and look for the solutions. Um, then um, there's a very um, convenient feature that is um, the, the uh, flow equation also encodes non-perturbative information by this right-hand side where we have the, um, um, this non-perturbative propagator and this basically also encodes higher order effects within the one loop structure that is given here. Um, then we can directly evaluate our beta, fun beta functions in five dimensions and, um, and maybe this is the strongest point, we can access information on the fixed point potential of the theory and study the stability. Okay, so let me start. We had this, uh, this cubic theory uh, with the hubbard sotonovich field, real valued field Z, and we have to set up a truncation, and what we do is basically we, here for our, for our first study, we uh, use this working horse truncation, which is basically a local potential approximation enhanced by these uniform wave function normalizations. Um, and uh, here the, the central thing is basically the, the effective potential, which depends on the field invariant rho, which is the square of this uh, field phi, basically. Or the, yeah. And um, then we have the Z field, of course, which is not bound by any symmetries. So it can also appear in odd orders of the potential. And so this is a two-field model. And uh, just to 
to mention this uh, very quickly, um, we have studied these uh, similar two-field and multi-field models before and on this level of the truncation and um, have confirmed that, um, for example, for multi-critical phenomena, this, uh, this level of the truncation gives good estimates for critical exponents. Yeah. So um, we can put this ansatz into uh, Christoph's equation and then um, basically can find a closed form for the, for the rescaled uh, dimensionless effective potential, which is this quantity. It depends, of course, on rho and z again, uh, rescaled forms of that. So in the first line, we basically have all the dimensional contributions. And in the uh, second and third line, we get these uh, threshold or these loop terms, which also include uh, the threshold connections from the non-trivial propagator. So, I mean, it's not about uh, really looking at these equations. It's just to show that we can really provide a, a closed form of these of these equations on that level. Okay, um, so, um, yeah, now I have to, to basically um, explain to you a little bit about the um, expansion of the effective potential. So um, here we'll, we will make an additional approximation um, and we'll do this in two different ansatzes. The first uh, ansatz is basically that we, um, we treat the um, um, row part of the field, so the, the, the part of the potential that is formulated in the, uh, in the original field, field phi, um, only quadratic in this, uh, in this order. And then we add basically a, a z-dependent uh, potential, which, for example, can be expanded in this Taylor uh, in this Taylor expansion. And this is, um, so you can, it, it's a severe appro approximation on the one hand, but it's basically um, similar, to, uh, very similar to what uh, we often do as a, as a first estimate for fermionic models when we introduce, uh, for example, the cross neuville yukawa theory. And this has also shown to give some quite um, reasonable estimates for critical exponents in these, in these theories. Then um, also um, this, um, this approximation is basically sufficient to recover exactly the results from the epsilon expansion as we approach six dimensions. And um, very importantly, we can also study the large n limit um, for the full um, separated um, z-dependent part of the potential where no expansion in the z-field is actually needed. So we can find an analyti analytical si um, solution here for, the, for this part of the effective potential and study stability. And um, in, a, in a second ansatz, we will also um, study a little bit uh, the more comprehensive two-field expansion and see what we can find out additionally on, on that issue. So um, also we have, of course, expressions for the anomalous dimensions, which can be uh, represented by these diagrams. But as I said, we don't go very much into calculations for now. It's just to show that these expressions are available. Okay, so let's directly look at some of the results. So um, this is a comparison between the um, leading order epsilon expansion results and um, different orders of our um, FIG ansatz um, for a number of uh, field components of 2000. So we, can, we have to go um, to, to a quite large value because in the epsilon expansion we know already that um, the fixed point only exists <coughs> Um, above about uh, n equals 1,000. And uh, so what you see here is a, not a very advantageous plot because we are looking really at non-universal fixed point couplings. So um, as soon as we approach the, basically this perturbative limit uh, close to six dimensions, at some point they really merge then, and they, they, they co converge nicely to each other. But when we move away, we also see the onset of, of non-perturbative effects basically. Uh. Um, and we can also compare for the, uh, with the anomalous dimensions. Here there's a, um, in, in a limit of six dimensions. It really nicely converges, but there are huge deviations um, as we approach five, five dimensions. So, um, but what this shows is basically it allows us to really relate the FRG fixed point to the epsilon expansion, make sure we're looking at the same quantity here. Agreement for six dimensions is, is quite nice and does not really depend on the particular choice of <clears throat> of the number of field components. That difference becomes sizable for 
uh, when we approach five dimensions. And what you also see in this plot is that the different orders of this uh, LPA, this is, it's a finite, finite expansion in the Taylor expansion, they are really lying on top of each other. They are hard distinguishable. So if you, if you look at the numbers, you see that there are still some differences, but here it converges really very nicely. Okay, so um, with this setup, we can come um, to the FRG answer to the first uh, to the first question, namely, what is the critical number of um, field components in five five dimensions? And so, just uh, to remind you very quickly of what has been already introduced in the in the previous talk is that um, in the leading order epsilon expansion, the the critical number of field components is um, thousand. 38 or 1039, and it does not depend on, um, on the number of dimensions. However, this is different when you go to higher uh, orders of the, of the epsilon expansion. There you get uh, some dependence on the dimensionality, actually. You get a pretty sizable term in, uh, in um, epsilon squared and um, uh, also still sizable, quite sizable term in epsilon uh, to the 3. And uh, this will also be the case in the FRG. So, um, we will find that the, the critical number of field components is basically um, uh, strongly dependent of the dimension. And so here are some numbers to flash. So when we are very close to, to six dimensions, we are, of course, also close to the uh, leading order epsilon result. But once we go uh, to 5.9, 5.8, 5.7, this number drops very quickly. So um, this is already some, some nice hint. But um, if we look a little bit closer to how um, the fixed point values actually uh, evolve once we go from very large n to smaller n, we see some also quite intriguing behavior. So let's, for example, look at, at this curve, which is basically the purple, the purple uh, line, uh, which represents uh, d equals 5.9. The thing is that here at some point, this is actually the 623, the fixed point values disappear into the complex plane. Yeah? Um, but when we try to, uh, to continue this curve, uh, we see that uh, a real valued fixed point pops up again at smaller values of the field. And so here you can basically add for yourself a guide, uh, a line that is a guide to the eye. Here in between, the, the, the fixed point values are actually complex. But uh, then it reappears again. Yeah? And this can also be seen at the other fixed point coupling, which is basically the C to the 3 coupling. And when we decrease the number of dimensions, these, so these two separate islands, they, uh, they approach e each other. And below uh, 5.65 dimensions, they really merge. And it seems like there, is, uh, there uh, could be a, um, a fixed point all the way down to, to, small, to small n. So um, I think this, uh, this next slide basically summarizes a little bit more on what I've said. And I've also added um, the results for the corresponding results for the anomalous dimensions here. Uh, so we have two islands um, of, on the n-axis where the fixed point exists for um, dimensions that are sufficiently close to six dimensions, and these islands merge at uh, 5.65. So, um, yeah, um, I think um, I would like to get to the next slide. So um, this, this behavior goes on once we, we decrease the number of, uh, of dimensions. So this is basically starting at 5.65, uh, 5 Point 0.5 and so on until um, 5 and you see that the behavior also becomes smoother and smoother. So um, what we also find here, it's maybe uh, interesting to look at this large n behavior, so the, the anomalous dimension of the phi field always approaches zero and the one of the, of the z field actually be, uh, behaves like this. It, uh, it approaches a value which is 6 minus d, which is also a very nice result actually. And um, yeah, this, uh, I can summarize these findings on the critical n a little bit in this, in this plot here. So basically in the hashed area, this is uh, uh, the, the region where the fixed point um, of this theory exists um, in the epsilon to the 3 expansion, so a 3 loop ep epsilon expansion. And the, the whole gray area is actually the, the, the FRG prediction now. And here you see that there's a, a rather small region where no fixed point exists in, uh, on the real axis. But here, this is uh, basically the point where these, so if you look at some particular dimension, you get these two islands for large and for small n, and they just merge at 5.65. So that's um, the first. Uh, answer from the FRG perspective that I can offer. Let's go to the next next question that I have asked. Ah, no, I, I had an additional remark. Um, so this is 
at the moment it's more or less a numerical finding of, of, of the solution of our fixed point equation. So, but um, uh, we try to put some more thought into that to 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 find reasons why we should uh, why we could believe these these results, why we think that they could be tentatively reasonable. And uh, the thing is that when you look at um, four plus epsilon. Um, dimensions, then uh, you have an ON Wilson Fisher fixed point, which I introduced in the beginning, which is not stable, but um, the, the conjecture is that this fixed point is somehow connected to the six minus epsilon dimensional case where we study the, uh, the cubic theory. And here in the, in the pure ON model, above, uh, closely above four dimensions, the, this, ex this fixed point basically exists for all N. So there's, um, there's no limit to N as long as the epsilon. Uh, is small. And so, as the conjecture is that this um, fixed point in the cubic theory is basically a, some sort of an analytic uh, continuation of the ON Wilson Fisher fixed point toward a four dimension, we would expect for the cubic theory that uh, there exists some non integer critical dimension between four and six where these islands merge. And this is exactly what we basically observe. So, where um, the fixed point exists for all ends that are larger than zero. And uh, our result was the 5.65, basically, which you, which you see here. Yeah. Also, if you look just at the, um, at the behavior of the epsilon to the three, it also seems to, to bend down. And uh, so the, I think there, there would also be some room for, for a similar be behavior that you could observe. And uh, just as a sh short side remark, there's a very similar behavior in the three-dimensional abelian Higgs model. So um, there's also some sort of a fixed point that ceases to exist below a critical number of, in this case, um, complex scalars, and which uh, is severely uh, reduced at higher orders. And there are also FRG, fixed dimension perturbative RG, and also QMC results, which suggest that the, the true um, number of, of um, complex scalars where um, the fixed point ceases to exist is actually smaller than one. So this is work by Bergerov. Um, I think uh, Christoph was also, also involved in that. Uh, the fixed dimension is uh, Herbert and uh, Tezanovic. And um, there is a number of QMC results. And I, th I think I quoted here the, the, the latest one. <clears throat> And um, there's another hint that um, this small n solutions might be uh, sensible, and that is even in the epsilon expansion, when you do not uh, decouple a purely scalar mode, but you, you make a tensorial decoupling of this, um, then you also find uh, solutions for O2 and the O3 model, basically, which is um, work by uh, Lucas was also involved in that, and Igor Herbert earlier this year. So, but th this is pure epsilon expansion then. <coughs> Okay, so this brings me to the, the second question. How am I doing in time? 12 minutes, yeah. Okay, so um, I will basically flash through it. So we can calculate, of course, uh, the universal, universality classes by uh, looking at the stability matrix and extracting the critical exponents from the eigenvalues. If you look at the... Um, whoa, where am I now? Okay. Okay. Voila. Um, so the, the pure ON model in uh, above four dimensions, um, there is um, um, in, in the large, no, I'm discussing now the large, uh, large N solutions, you find two infrared relevant directions with uh, analytically known um, um, critical exponents, so basically the correlation length exponent is one over d minus two, just like you would expect it also from the situation below four dimensions. And um, the second one is the subleading exponent is four minus d. And uh, we can now uh, analyze our, our data on the cubic fixed point and what we basically find is, so first of all, that is something I already quoted, we found that the anomalous dimension of the phi field goes to zero and the one of the z field goes to six minus d. And uh, what we find additionally in uh, terms of the critical exponents are three relevant directions now. So um, the first one agrees basically with this one, which is just the inverse. Then the second one with this one, and then there's an additional relevant direction, clearly relevant direction with scaling dimension two. So what we have in this situation is a three-dimensional critical hypersurface. 
So, um, what we can say from this finding is basically that uh, the universality class from the pure ON model um, seems to be embedded in the one of the, of the cubic model because here we basically have to, to place ourselves on a particular part of the hypersurface and then um, basically the model, as soon as we have restricted to a particular hypersurface, the model basically behaves like, like the pure ON model in this uh, large N limit. Okay, so now the final question. Um, is about the stability of the potential. And um, here um, I would like to, to mention also some previous work that has been done in the, in the FRG framework that uh, were works by um, Roberto and Gianpaolo and also Peter Marti. Um, so they discussed the stability of the potential of the pure ON model um, above five dimensions. So, um, and therefore they, they, um, they uh, employed a mix of analytical and numerical um, um, approaches that you can do within the FRG and what they basically find is that within the pure N model without a hubbard sartonovic field um, no stable and physically admissible fixed point solution exists between four and six dimensions and um, solutions what they find is uh, that the solutions are either unbounded from below or they are singular and not globally defined so it's not acceptable however um, so and this is where we would like to make our contribution um, this formulation within the pure ON model possibly misses some important non-perturbative information that is somehow encoded in the momentum dependence of the hubbard sartonovic field. So um, we will basically try to analyze um, the same question again with this uh, extended uh, model, which is closer to the, to the model that was formulated by Klebanov and, and co-workers. Okay, so let's start. Uh, again, I want to um, show the, the ansatz which we are making. It's, it's a very much simplified ansatz which only is um, bilinear in the phi field and then has a, um, a general um, potential in the Z field. And uh, the thing is that uh, if you look closely at the possible loop contributions that can, uh, can um, go into the uh, flow equation at that point, you see that in the large N limit, no higher orders in the invariant row appear at leading order in one over n. So additional actions, uh, interactions are basically only generated at subleading order in one over n, and also the feedback into these flow equations um, of, the, of the effective potential is only subleading. So basically, this ansatz is um, a very well, um, very well suited ansatz or very well suited truncation that captures basically all contributions to the effective action at leading order in one over n. So for large n, it should work. And just to um, be explicit um, in the following, without even showing you um, explicit expressions on the equations, we will work in the, in the sharp cutoff scheme because that um, showed to give us some nice computational simplifications. Okay. Now what's going on? Yeah. So the flow of the effective potential in this large n limit basically can be written down in this, in this form with only one um, threshold functions. The others are basically suppressed in this in leading order one over n. And uh, then we have a separate flow equation for the mass of the phi field, which is just given by this very simple, uh, very simple uh, dimensional contribution. We have already found out that the anomalous dimension of the phi field approaches zero. And that means that the fixed point in the phi, in, in the, in the phi mass is basically zero too. So now we can write down the loop contributions to the zero coupling, which is the, basically the bosonic Yukawa coupling in this theory. And it also comes basically only with a dimensional term. That means the fixed point will be located at uh, anomalous dimension equals six minus d, also a result that we have already found previously. At the same time, the expression for the anomalous dimension of the Z field reduces to, to this very simple e equation so we can directly evaluate the fixed point value. And that is very convenient because we have then the fixed point value for the G and for the M we can put it into the, uh, into the threshold function and directly solve um, the, um, the flow equation for the, for the uh, Z potential. And that's what we do. Um, and it looks like this. So it's not a very uh, pleasant expression. Um, it uh, is formulated in different um, um, for different values of the field in, in different ways, but it smoothly connects basically when you, wow, that's now a disaster because it doesn't show my, ah, okay, uh, now, <laughs> 
Okay, I can. Uh, I think I can make up for this. So if you plot this, um, if you plot this potential, it basically looks like on the next slide, the one that uh, is uh, properly displayed, like the the gray curve. Yeah, and um, this is the result if we um, if we take the freedom that we have in the solution of this equation. So uh, the point is that you can always for this particular flow equation only, and this will not hold for, for other flow equations, for example, for the pure N model, you can add the homogeneous solution with an arbitrary constant. This will always remain a solution because um, the flow equation actually does not depend on 1 over 1 plus V uh, uh, derivatives of the, of the potential itself. So you can do this. And um, so neglecting this term basically gives you the potential that you see here in this slide, and it's not bound from below. So it has a... Uh, it basically goes to minus infinity here. But if you add one of these non-analytic ter terms, which you're allowed to do, so the z to the 5 half term, then you see that um, basically here the potential is not modified, at least here close to this minimum, um, but uh, you, can, uh, you can get an um, upwards bending here on the side and you can basically save your potential. But at the same time, so without the non-analytic contribution, the potential is globally unstable. But if you add the non-analytic contribution, the potential becomes globally stable. But at the same time, one has to say that in this case, we don't have any more uh, um, a simple interpretation in terms of Feynman diagrams or a way to expand the theory, basically. So this is, um, this is that finding. And, um, well, I think I can come to my conclusions rather quickly. So... Um, as an add-on to, uh, to this finding, we also wanted to, to find out a little bit of the behavior at a still large but a little bit smaller n, um, so uh, finite n, and we, therefore we uh, have to go back to the two-field expansion because then the situation that the, the second field only appears quadratic in the, in the potential is not true anymore. So um, we have to take into account these... Uh, we can make a two-dimensional um, two Taylor expansion, basically. And if we just expand it, uh, if we just look at the z direction, then we see that this Taylor expansion basically uh, close to the minimum very nicely reproduces the result. So this is for n equals 10,000, still pretty large n. Um, the Taylor expansion, even in pretty low orders, uh, approaches very nicely this analytic result. And now if you look into the, um, into the phi direction, so this is the z direction. We have a second direction, which should also be stable. Um, what you find is basically that both, both mass terms of both fields are positive, so they basically produce a local minimum. However, in the phi direction, phi direction all the higher order couplings have negative fixed point values. So um, that's what you basically, I think the nicest plot is, uh, is basically here. You see when you go to higher orders, um, from blue to green to black, um, of the expansion in the phi field, then it gets deeper and steeper that you get an instable potential. So um, I think the fairest thing to say, or the most careful thing, is um, that here we do not find an indication for stabilization for the potential. Uh, find more uh, indication for destabilization of the potential. Okay, I think that should bring me to my conclusions. Um, time. Um, so um, let me just summarize of uh, what I've um, showed you. So. Um, what is the NC in D equals 5, and what we find is that below the critical dimension of 5.65, um, a real fixed point exists basically for all N. Then, what about the equivalence of the cubic theory and the original or N model? So we have two relevant uh, critical exponents that precisely agree at large N. However, the cubic model features an additional RG-relevant direction. So, um, what we can say is basically that the ON universality class is embedded in that of the cubic model, but the models seem to be not fully equivalent unless some of the couplings are placed on a critical hypersurface of the fixed point. So you can also put this in other terms. You can really consider the, the Z field that has been introduced in hubbard sotonovich uh, kind of way as some, some indi independent degree of freedom, which really adds some additional information. And finally, um, what can we say about the stability of the fixed point potential at large <coughs> n? The, um, the fixed point potential seems to be globally unstable unless non analytic terms are added. Um, then at finite n, the model exhibits a local minimum, and the higher order terms are all negative. And 
um, this suggests more like an instability at larger values of the phi field. And with this, I'm finished, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>